If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, and I'll be preaching from 2 Kings chapter 7. The text will be verse 9, but I want to begin reading in verse 3, 2 Kings chapter 7, beginning with verse 3, and the title of the message today is very simply, Sharing the Good News. Sharing the Good News. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why do we sit here until we die? If we say we'll enter the city, then the famine is in the city, and we'll die there. If we sit here, we'll die also. Now, therefore, come, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we'll live. If they kill us, we'll just but die. They arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans, and when they came to the outskirts of the camp, the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel is hired against us, the king of the Hittites, and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore, they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents, their horses, their donkeys, the camp just as it was, and fled for their lives. And when these lepers, when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank and carried from there silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them, and they returned and entered another tent and carried them there also and went and hid them. And here's the text. And then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This day is a day of good news, but we're keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, therefore, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come. Let us go and tell the king's household, sharing the good news. Christopher Searcy was playing basketball with some friends on May the 16th, 1998. When he was shot in the chest by a stray bullet and it pierced one of, uh, a portion of his heart, his friends helped to get him within 40 feet of the entrance of Ravenswood Hospital And then they went inside and asked for help. The hospital staff refused to help Christopher, saying that it was against hospital policies to administer aid to those outside the hospital. Eventually, a policeman was able to get a wheelchair and wheel him into the hospital where he was helped by the staff, but it was too late. Christopher died within an hour of being put into the hospital. And the man died because the rescuers refused to venture outside the compound. I was privileged uh, many years ago in the 90s. I was part of a mission team that went to the uh, Philippine Islands. I, I didn't know anything about the Philippines before I went. and know very little about it now. But I had a great mission trip there, and I was privileged to go to what they call a leper colony. And uh, what the Bible calls leprosy was a whole variation of what we now know are different skin diseases. Uh, And so in this village in in, in, uh, in one of the islands in the Philippines, they had a leper colony and they had it separated for the men. There was about eight or 9,000 people living there. And we went from house to house sharing the gospel and and, uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience to get to to meet these people. But in the Bible, when you got leprosy, people didn't come and, and associate with you. As a matter of fact, you had to put a rag over your face and you had to, with anybody got within 15 feet of you, you had to shout out, unclean, unclean. And so these four lepers have been pushed outside the gate. Now, let me tell you, what's going on inside the gate, we'll soon see, is not any thing to brag about either. 
And so the central truth of this message is the world needs to hear the good news of what God has done. I want to go back into the story. I'm not going to just read through the text, but I want to walk through the text with you. And I want you to see a picture of the world today, a picture of a world without hope. Look back in chapter 6 and verse 24, and listen to what it says. It says, And it came after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, what you see in this picture that we're going to look at demonstrates and illustrates a world that, that is in a desperate place without Christ. This is a horrible picture. Notice what's going on in verse 26. There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth a cab, that's about a quart, of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now, the economy around here ain't got that bad yet. But uh, that's pretty bad, isn't it? And uh, uh, when I say the world, I'm talking about the world without Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 6, uh, uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world, I'm talking about the society, the culture, the thought processes, the unchristian atmosphere that you and I inhabit until Jesus comes again. And so I want you to see two or three things about the world. Number one, the world without hope is a place of oppression. It's a place of oppression. Now, th at this point, what's happened is the, the, the tribes of Israel have had a civil war. And the northern tribes became known as the, the nation of Israel. And the southern tribes, which was Judah, became known as the nation of Judah. The northern tribes were always at war and besieged with Samaria, their neighbors to the north. The text here calls them the Arameans. It's the same people as the Samarians. And so Judah had split, and uh, the Syrian army, under the command of Ben-Hadad, had raided and constantly came against uh, the northern tribes. And the capital city was Samaria. Samaria was the Jerusalem for the northern tribes. Ben-Hadad had surrounded this walled city, not allowing any food or water to go in and no people to come out. So you can imagine what's happening inside the city. Well, we see in there, if you read on, that there are two women who uh, are starving to death and they approach the king who's sitting on the wall, sitting in sackcloth. And the king says, what can I do for you? And they say, well, here's the problem, king. You see, yesterday we boiled my son and ate him, and we were going to eat hers today, but she won't give him up. Now, I know it's ironic, and it, you know, it's, but that's the kind of place they were in. Why were they in that place? Well, they were in that place because they had forsaken God. Uh, listen, the Bible is very specific when it tells the, the, the people of Israel that if they ever turned their back on God and began to worship other idols, that God would strike them mad with, with insanity and that they would be besieged by their enemies and cannibalize their young. That's what it says in the law of Moses. And lo and behold, for years, God had been calling them to come back to him and they refused. Now they're reaping what they've sowed. And so today we find a whole world that's been deceived by the devil. The devil deceives us and he causes us to believe that sin is pleasurable and good. But the devil is a liar. Y'all know the devil's a liar, right? It's like the young boy who was out on his uh, Boy Scout camp out and he picked up this talking snake. He found this snake and the snake was talking to him. And he said, my, my camp leader said not to touch any snakes. And the snake said, but wouldn't I be a great pet? Look how nice I am. He said, but if I pick you up, you might bite me. He said, I won't bite. I don't bite people. And so the boy put him in his shirt and he went back to his tent. Guess what happened? That night when everybody's asleep, the snake crawled out, bit everybody. And so the boy grabbed the snake and he said, you said you wouldn't bite. He said, you knew I was a snake when you picked me up. Y'all not understand that? 
You play with a snake, a snake don't change. Listen, the devil is a liar and the devil's always lying. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Many people have swallowed the devil's lie that the way to happiness and self-fulfillment is achieved by getting rid of your old puritanical beliefs and embrace the new morality. Beloved, let me tell you something. The new morality is nothing but the old morality that's been repackaged and regurgitated for a new generation. It's kind of like toothpaste. You know what I mean? How many times can toothpaste be new and improved? Because I'm thinking just in my lifetime, as good as it's been improved, it ought to put every dentist in America out of business. <laughs> New and improved, it's the same old toothpaste. And the devil's lies are just repackaged for a new generation. Beloved, the new morality is the same old-fashioned sin that it's always been. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say unto you, everyone who commits sin is slave to sin. The devil convinces people that freedom means to throw off all restraints. That's not freedom, bro. That's bondage. Every person I know who's tried that is in bondage to sin. Perhaps you saw last week uh, uh, some uh, uh, people in our culture were uh, uh, given a hero award by the L.A. Dodgers. It was a group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And uh, don't bother checking them up. They're, they're, they're a filthy bunch of people. Uh, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are a leading edge order. This is their definition. I didn't write this. Come off their website. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are a leading edge order of queer and trans nuns. Uh, they believe, or they say, we believe all people have the right to express their unique joy and beauty. That sounds good, doesn't it? Since our first appearance in San Francisco on Easter Sunday, 1979, the sisters have devoted ourselves to community service, ministry and outreach to those on the edges, and promoting human rights, respect for diversity, and spiritual enlightenment. We use humor and irreverent wit to expose the forces of bigotry, complacency, and guilt that chain the human spirit. Now, that's the devil packaging up his, uh, uh, his filth for a new generation. And people are swallowing it hook, line, and sinker. And the world is so self-righteous today in its anti-God uh, uh, stance. It's Romans 1 says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, first off, they have to just deny the truth. Secondly, he says, the devil wants you to profess yourself to be wise. He said they became fools. And then he goes on to say, their mind is twisted with perversion, and they, they have become reprobate in their mind. They can't even think straight. This is what the world is today. The world is in an oppressive place. The world hates for somebody to preach the truth. Amos 5.10 said, they hate the one who reproves in the gate. In other words, they don't want any preachers. They don't want anybody to talk Bible to them. They want you to get rid of the Bibles. Young people, they're telling you that everywhere. Media everywhere. All the outlets in, in the songs and in the movies and all over are saying, listen, you don't need any of that old-fashioned morality. What you need is a, is a dose of this good old liberation. And what they're really peddling is bondage. Beloved, the world and even some within the church today are telling us that we ought to accept, endorse, and celebrate sin. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak about the things which are done by them in secret. There it is. That's the Bible. That's black ink on white paper, man. That's, that's the Word of God. And biblical freedom is freedom from the bondage of sin, not the freedom to engage in sin. And so we need to know the distinction. The world without Christ is a place besieged. It's a, it's a place oppressed by sin. Then I want you to see the world without hope is a place of desperation. They're eating donkey dung and uh, uh, talking about boiling their children. 
Now, I read up on this donkey dung, this uh, dove's dung thing. Uh, and some scholars are saying, well, they didn't really use that. Uh, to, they, they burnt their food on it. They, they cooked with it. Hey, I don't care what they do with it. Can I get an amen? Because when you say, low, you're eating that or cooking with that. That's bad. That's, that's bad, man. I've been low, but I ain't been that bad. And I, uh, the, 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 but, 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 you know, the world don't have any solutions. Uh, it's, a, it's a desperate place. Uh, I, I was reading about uh, a 72-year-old woman body was found floating uh, off in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Evidently, she had uh, committed suicide by walking out into the water and drowning. It was a mystery, and they went back to her apartment. They found a suicide note pinned to her pillow, and all it said was, who cares? I wonder how many people feel that way in our culture. How many people are just, they don't have a, they don't have a relationship with God, they don't have a church, they don't have a community, something's happened. I don't know, man. But I know the world is a, de- a place that where people are desperate. And so uh, the third thing I want you to see is the world without hope is a place of confusion. I want you to look in verse 31, something kind of comical to me. Uh, the king is mad at the preacher because the preacher said this was going to happen because he knew the word of God. And so in verse 31, the king's sitting up there. He's in sackcloth. The woman's just discussed eating her children. And the, and the king, he's just all, all bent out of shape. And then he said, verse 31, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shephat, remains on him today. <laughs> now that's being mad about a sermon, I'm here to tell you, man. Uh, don't cut my head off. I'll apologize before you do that. Uh, uh, but uh, listen, Elisha's not the problem, is he? Elisha, all he is is the delivery boy. Y'all not kill the delivery boy for delivering the news, amen? Uh, This is indicative of the spiritual problem that the people of Israel had. Isaiah said in Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They got this thing flip-flopped, man. The devil has so oppressed them and so uh, caused them to feel so desperate, and now they're in total confusion. Somebody designated the month of June as Gay Pride Month. Well, it almost makes me sad I was born in this month, but nonetheless, it's another story. The retail store Target had a line of gay clothing. The designer of that line of clothing is a Satanist. And uh, here's a quote from him. This is an actual quote. He said, Satanists don't actually believe in Satan. (laughs) (laughs) Of course not, right? (laughs) Satanists don't actually believe in Satan. He's merely used as a symbol of passion, pride, and liberty. He means to do you, he means to you what you need him to mean. I bet he does. So for me, Satan is hope, compassion, equality, and love. So naturally, Satan respects pronouns. He loves all LGBT plus people. He said, I went with a variation. He's talking about designing those clothes for Target. He said, I went with a a variation of Baphomé, which is a uh, a French name for a demon who is... uh, uh, transsexual. And for this design, a deity who themselves is a mixture of genders, beings, ideas, and existence. He said, I had to deal with the aftermath of those people and their hatred. Do you see how they have turned darkness into light? Do you see how they call good bad and bad good? Do you see what's going on in our culture? Young people, do not fall for this. This is a lie from the very pit of hell itself, and it's all designed. It's, it's packaged up to say here is freedom, but when you swallow it, you'll swallow a belly full of bondage. That's what it is. 
I had to deal with some of these so-called Satanists. Grandmother brought a little boy to me one time and said, his daddy killed himself. And I don't know, I, I, don't have, I don't know how to tell him. Will you tell him? All I knew about the man was what the newspaper said. The newspaper said they found his body in the woods. He had gotten out in the woods and he had satanic uh, literature strewn about all, all around him and some candles and some stuff he was using. And he took his own life sitting there. And this grandmother says, I, I don't know how to tell him that his daddy killed himself. I want you to tell him because I don't want him to find out at school and I can't tell him. So when I prayed about what to do, I, I, I was nervous. A little eight-year-old boy come in, he sat down, and I said, you know your daddy's gone, don't you? He's, yeah. And I said, what do you think your daddy would tell you today if he could talk to you? And that little guy said about the saddest thing I believe I've ever heard. He, a big old tear went rolling down one cheek. He said, I don't know what he would say because I ain't never heard him talk. See, that's what Satan is selling. That's what Satan's peddling. Death, destruction, bondage, guilt, shame. That's the wages of sin. And so uh, today, uh, you know, we got people in our, just like this guy, he, he's the king, and they're all telling the king, king, we need help, we need help. And finally, the king says something that's about the only honest thing I ever heard a politician say. He said, even if God, I, there's no help, I can't help you. It reminds me of the, the fairy tale. Y'all remember teaching your children, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Well, that's cute. Little egg busted all over the ground. Humpty Dumpty was an egg, right? But do you remember the last line? All the king's horses and all the king's men, they couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, that's the problem today, folks. That's the problem in the world today. There's been a great fall. Humanity has fallen into sin and the deception of the evil one and into bondage and all the king's horses and all the king's men with their think tanks and their institutions and their higher learning and their science and their, and their wisdom can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And they can't put a broken sinner's heart back together again either. Only God can do that. Amen. Praise God we have a message of hope. And I want you to see the message of hope. First off, I want you to see it is a very simple message. Notice how simple it is. In verse 1, chapter 7. Then Elisha said, listen to the word of the Lord. There it is. There it is. Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine wheat will be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now, that message was so simple that notice in verse 2, that message is so simple that in verse 2, there's an officer there whose hand the king was leaning, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Then he said, Well, behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. Well, uh, have you ever, uh, we were talking about this just this morning, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the music guys, uh, have you ever uh, lost something and looked everywhere for it and it was right there in your pocket? <laughs> Y'all are laughing because you, you've done it recently. Uh, David Fallon said he looked everywhere for his keys. It was in his back pocket. I, I, I don't know how many screwdrivers I've lost in my back pocket. Uh, but the worst, the worst, the worst is... Cindy, we're out of ketchup. No, we're not. It's right there. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't figure out. Listen, 
that, that, this, this guy, this guy, this king's advisor, he's in verse two, he's sitting there and he's saying, how is this going to happen? You said there's going to be bread at the gate of Samaria. I know there's enemy out there. I know there's famine in here. I know there's lepers over there. And there ain't been no food come in here in months. And you're saying we're going to, well, it's impossible. But notice what he told him to do. Listen to the word of the Lord. See, God don't care what's possible because with him, all things are possible. And so uh, it's wonderful that we have good news to share. Listen, uh, this guy couldn't figure out how any food was going to get in that place. He even says that God couldn't help and and they're doomed. And so uh, God has the solution and the solution's name is Jesus and Jesus Christ is the hope of a desperate world. God's good news for our oppressed, sin, sin sick, sin soaked world is to turn their eyes towards Calvary's cross, look unto the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, and by faith receive him as their Lord and Savior and allow him to indwell their hearts and change their lives. Beloved, this soul-saving, heart-changing, life-giving gospel, it's a simple message. It's so simple. It's so simple that even children understand it. As a matter of fact, they understand it easier than most adults do. It's so simple. Uh, Theologian Karl Barth wrote, I got a set of commentary somebody gave me. If you want them, I'll, I'll let you have them. But anyway, they're, they're about this long, a lot of words in there. He lectured all over the, the United States, and, and, and you, he was a theologian. And, and somebody asked him one time, Dr. Barth, what is the greatest theological truth that you've ever come across? Without a moment's hesitation, he said, I can tell you that. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And you just don't get any deeper than that. Praise God. Hey, the message of hope is a saving message. During the night, the Lord caused the Syrians to hear the sound of chariots. Their men saw the Israelites had hired the Hittites and the Egyptians. In fear and confusion, they fled that night, leaving all their provisions. In verse 8 of uh, 2 Kings 7, it said that those lepers went in the tent, and they ate, and they drank, and they got silver, and they got gold, they got clothes, and then they went and took that and hid it and come back and got another load. I see here a beautiful picture of grace. I see here that those unclean lepers were stained and filthy, They have no power, no influence to save themselves. Those lepers are like we are, that we are in desperate situation without God and without hope until we see what God has already done. Do you notice that conversation they had? They said, man, if we sit here, we know what's going to happen. If we go over there, we don't know what's going to happen. So let's go over there. When they got over there, they saw what God had already done. Beloved, when we look by faith to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and we see him and who, who, who died and buried and rose again on the third day and by faith we put our faith and trust in him, it is so simple that God saves us because of what Jesus did for us. And so, and so uh, uh, we, we just need to look into the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, it's a saving message. And we can't save ourselves. A lot of people think they can. They try to by doing good works, and, and uh, they think salvation is something to be earned. Somehow people get the idea that grace is something that God gives them uh, when they prove their worth or when they prove they're worthy. Uh, you think about these lepers. What had they done to deserve all these gifts? They didn't do anything to deserve it. Uh, the, the Bible says that, that the, 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 uh, we're saved by grace, and it is a free gift. Free gift. Several years ago, back in the 90s, Cindy's daddy, he gifted our family with an almost brand new, I mean, it didn't have many miles on it, Minivan. Well, we had uh, my daughter Sarah, and we had two foster boys, and we needed more room. Plus, our car was junky, and so uh, he must have felt sorry uh, for for his daughter. So uh, <laughs> he bought he bought us a van, and he gave it to us. Uh, I was very appreciative of that. Now I want you to just imagine uh, if if a conversation went like this, and 
Earl, her dad's name was Earl. He called me up and he says, uh, Steve, uh, it's been a long time since y'all been over. Uh, we, at that time, we didn't live that far from there. It's been a long time since y'all been over. When, when, when are y'all going to come visit? Well, Earl, I'm going to come as soon as I, can, as soon as I get my license. And, and uh, Earl, I'm going to come as soon as I get the van paid off. Paid off? Yeah, yeah, I got to pay it off. What do you mean, pay it off? Well, I, I, I got to pay. I, I gave you the van. All you got to do is get in and drive it. You ain't got to make payments on it. You ain't got to earn it. You don't need it. You don't even deserve it. As a matter of fact, the reason you got it is because you're married to my daughter. Because I ain't buying ever man a van. I'm buying you a van. And listen, beloved, we get saved because of what Jesus does for us, not because we deserve it, not because we earn it. We couldn't earn it if we tried. It's a free gift. It's a free I said it's a free gift. Man, I wish the world would get a hold. I wish most religious folks would earn that. I don't know how many people there are today. They're in churches just trying, trying, trying to earn their way into heaven. You're insulting God's grace by doing that. It is a free gift. And all you can do with a free gift is receive it. Amen. And then, let me end. The message of hope is a shareable message. Down to our text. He says in verse 9, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news. And we're keeping quiet. We're keeping silent. If we wait until the morning light, punishment's going to overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go tell the king's household. These men immediately realized that they had a moral obligation to share this good news. I think we overcomplicate sharing the gospel. I think we overthink it. Sharing the gospel is not hard. It's not difficult. But let me, let me just say, the gospel is not a debate to be won. The gospel is not a moral billy club used to beat somebody into submission. The gospel is not an argument to be won. It's not a philosophy to be defended. The gospel is telling somebody about your relationship with somebody who's very real. And his name is Jesus. You've heard me. Y'all have heard me. The older I get, the more sentimental I get toward my dad. I don't mind telling you about my daddy. I don't mind telling you about him even if you don't want to hear it. (laughs) And I'll tell you what, if I talk to you about my wife, I expect you to stand there and listen because you know how much I care for her. Amen? Amen? And if my wife is telling you about her grandkids, don't you move. What I'm trying to say is the people that we love and that are important to us in our life, we we don't mind talking to other people about them. It's not an argument to be won. It's not a cause to be... it's, 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 man, let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen. Listen, there's this thought going around. I'll end with this thought. There's this idea going around, and I see it in print sometimes, and it's not, in, it's, not, it's not wrong, but it's deficient. It says something like, witness for Jesus, and if you need to use words, then use them. But I'm going to tell you why that's deficient. That's deficient. Because just demonstrating good behavior or Christian morality is not sharing the gospel. You see, when you do that, the person observing you may get the wrong impression that you're just a real good person. And that the reason you're doing that is because you're religious. And they might give you the glory or the credit 
and never even think about Jesus. I tried that when I first became a Christian. I, my pastor gave me this book. It's called A Survival Kit. And it's a daily devotion, and it's a very good exercise, and, and I recommend them. They're still in print. Uh, uh, it starts in day one. It goes for six weeks. And, 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 and my pastor gave me that, and he said, I want you to do this. We were going out to sea, and uh, I was doing it at my desk in, my, in the little shop where we, where we did the hydraulic work. And there was a, a first-class petty officer. His name was Ernie, and he would sit right beside me, and I had a Bible, I had my survival kit, and he had watched as I had gone from just totally heathen to now trying to serve the Lord. He saw all that. I don't know how many times I felt led in my heart. Share something, say something, start a conversation. But because he was my boss, and it's just, I, just, I just settled on the fact that I'll just be a good witness here and if he wants to ask any questions, well, he never asked any questions. And I never said anything. I got discharged out of the Navy, and we went to church two weeks after I got discharged. Two weeks after I got discharged. We were getting out of the car. Cindy and I were fixing to go into church. One of the guys that was in, in, on the ship with me, he, he come driving in kind of out of the blue. And I started asking about the, the people that I was working with. I said, uh, how is Ernie? He said, hadn't you heard? Yeah. He said, Ernie's dead. I said, really? What happened? Ernie was 36 years old. He, he went home from a party after having just two drinks, drove home, Went to bed that night and died in his sleep. No symptoms or no anything. And somebody said, well, do you know whether Ernie would be saved? I mean, you didn't share the gospel with him and he didn't get saved. How, would you, how do you know he would have gotten saved? Well, you know what? I don't know. But here's what I do know. That he wasn't saved and I didn't share. That's what I know. Would you stand with me this morning? Bow your head and close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Christopher Searcy died right outside the hospital because nobody would go outside. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe this morning you're here and you're not saved. You've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Right now, in this, in, in the, in this invitation time, if you want to be saved, you've never been saved, would you just say a simple, heartfelt, sincere prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm a sinner. I can't fix myself. I, I, I'm, I'm broken like Humpty Dumpty. I, I, I can't put myself back together. But I trust you can. You can give me a new life. Today I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and help me live for you. If you just said that prayer in just a few moments, we're going to begin to sing. We call that an invitation hymn. It's to invite people that have invited Christ into their heart. Just come forward. We got pastors up here. We got deacons up here. I'll be up here. We won't embarrass anybody. We never put you on the spot. But then maybe this morning, you want to come up here because you got a friend that's not saved. And you want to pray for that person. You don't have to come to the altar and pray for that person, but you can if you want to. Or maybe there's somebody specifically this, this very day that God has laid on your heart to talk to and to share Christ. Would you make a, de a decision today to ask God to help you to share Christ? I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. If you need to come, maybe to join our church, if you've been baptized, 
after salvation by believers' baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We accept that. If you need to be baptized, you need to come forward. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you could use something that was said today. Some life will be changed forevermore. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.